it's pretty difficult to speak after these quite extraordinary presentations, I think, this morning. And I thank you for them. And I thank all of you for the presentations over these last few days and the comments. Very deeply meaningful to me. And, and I thank John and Jeff and his committee for convening us, invoking us, calling us to this task. Um, because I think we're a tribe of grief. We're somehow a tribe of grief trying to go forward. Um, and that's why we're moved by these stories. And um, I think in that, that sense, we're looking for an ethics of loss. We're looking for how to absorb loss. And we're looking for an ethics of affirmation, how to put those things together. And we've said over the last few days that change comes from, from fear and terror. But it's my firm belief, and I think many among us would say, change comes from terror and awe. It comes from fear and beauty. And this is the heart of the numinous, what Otto called the numinous, the holy, that we hold, I think, as a species right now, this great complexity of terror and beauty and how we go forward rests on this conjunction that we're trying to process, trying to move forward with um, in a whole range of ways. And I think the terror and beauty is particularly poignant because we know we are at the end of a geological era. This is, we are emerging at the end of a Cenozoic era because the other macrophase problem that has not been overtly mentioned here, along with climate change, is we are in the midst of a sixth extinction period. And that means since the 65 million year ago age when the dinosaurs were wiped out by meteor, that no extinction has taken place on the planet of this magnitude. And so what does it mean um, to take that in? that not only is climate change human-induced, but also a mass spasm of extinction. And this kind of loss, what does it mean? When my students say to me, why should I care if 12,000 or more species go extinct? Why should I care? Um, and when Niles Eldridge puts on the floor of the American Museum of Natural History in the Hall of Biodiversity, we are in the midst of this sixth extinction period, but we have the possibility of stemming the tide of destruction. And I think those are very significant words for what we're trying to do. In the midst of, of loss and beauty, we're trying to stem the tide of destruction and make way for a new creative civilization. And I think in doing that, we're drawing in our common creativity as humans. We are culture-making creatures. We are civilizational bearing creatures. And we bring the civilizations, the culture, symbolic making creativity to this task. And that's why the, the Jungian component is important. It's why the, the, the science in its new integrated and holistic form is important. All of these conjunctions are important. And I think in what I want to talk about today is bringing together as um, David Orr and I were speaking this morning, I think that there's a tremendous feeling here that there's a cultural shift, that there's a worldview shift, there's a worldview ethics shift, um, which brings psyche together, which brings matter spirit together in the ways that David dances into our midst. Um, and those are long-term changes. Those are changes that require new principles, new ethics, new partnership ethics, and so on. And at the same time, many of us are striving for and concerned about the urgent political transformations at hand. And those require strategy, and they require tactics, and they require legislation, they require management and restoration, all of these kinds of projects that Andrew highlighted for us yesterday and Norm brought to our attention, these tremendous and exciting projects that are happening, and what you brought from the business community um, as well. So I think the, this sense of cultural change that is long-term and political strategic change that is our task is coming together in a whole variety of ways. And I'm just, I'm going to say three things that we're working on, but I'm just going to focus on one in particular. 
Um, because we're trying to work on this sense that we are inheritors of this vast evolutionary process. That evolution, as has been mentioned in all kinds of eloquent ways around this group, is in our body being, is in the, the molecules, follicles, cells, and so on. And so this perspective that Thomas Berry, now 91 years old, and Brian Swim in this book, Universe Story, have brought into our midst is something we're trying to work on with a project um, on a film to illustrate this, to, to bring it alive in ways that bring the magic of, of image and feeling and participation and a sense of the urgency of our moment. And we're working with a film director who did the Cosmos series and also Ascent of Man and so on. And I think this will be a hopeful, positive sense, bringing the beauty in, not only the terror, bringing the awe in, the wonder in, that will empower people for the kinds of changes. And these, this perspective has empowered people ranging from John Seed, Rainforest Action, to all kinds of grassroots movements that need that larger perspective, that their work matters um, in, in a larger cultural shift. Um, what I'm going to talk about today a little bit more is the religion and ecology work that many of you have participated with um, at, at the Harvard Conference Series and beyond. But the third thing I want to bring to our attention that I've mentioned a few times here, and I think many of the ethicists have participated in this as well, is the Earth Charter, which I have copies of this here, and thank you for making them and so on. Um, but I think the Earth Charter, which brings together both a huge evolutionary framework, um, and I was part of the drafting process, and Eric Chase and a tremendous scientist um, from Tufts brought into the conversation this language, we're part of a vast evolving universe. Earth itself is alive with a myriad community of life forces, bringing together a scientific, a Gaian, and an indigenous perspective into an international document that came out of Rio, was a 10-year drafting process. Hundreds of thousands of citizens and groups weighed into this process, the most negotiated document of its time, of its type as well, a civil society document. But the three integrating sections of the Earth Charter are ecological integrity, social economic justice, how humans fit into these systems, and democracy, nonviolence, and peace. The fact, that I think, just that this global ethics, this charter of a suggestion for a blueprint for the future, the fact that it has emerged, along with many of these international covenants and so on, I think is a sign of immense importance and hope, a feedback sensibility that we are now creating. And this is really my deep conviction, um, and I think a sign of hope as we pass through the bottleneck that E.O. Wilson has described of this sixth extinction where the loss will be great. But we are passing through it to create an emerging multi-form, many vo voices, planetary civilization. For the first time in our 200 million year history as humans ever, we want to uh, imagine our, our length in time, but we are creating an emerging planetary civilization. And yes, there is clash, and yes, there is dialogue. And I, I'm not going to you know, make predictions about it. We, we, we need to recognize that, but our creativity and the creativity of many people right here is contributing to this emerging multiform planetary civilization. Now, I want to suggest um, something that hasn't been in our conversation, but I'm sure is in the back of our minds and experiences, how the religious communities of the world are beginning to enter into this emerging planetary civilization. And I certainly want to preface this discussion by saying we know the dark side. We're living with the immense clashing of civilizations and, and religious cultures and ideologies right now. But I do want to say that, um, that I think there are many signs of hope and that these traditions, for all of their problematic sides, need to be brought into the conversations, want to be part of the conversation, and can offer a moral force and efficacy and numbers beyond measure for transformation that what this global change is about is a hugely spiritual, moral 
ethical transformation. And it is not only, this is so interesting, it's not only about stewardship or management as, as we've known it, but as one of the, the significant theologians from the Greek Orthodox Church is saying, this is, this is an amazing shift, I think. It, it's not only stewardship, because that becomes a little managerial. He's saying, this is about the nature of who we are as humans. He's using this word ontology. It's about who we are as humans. This is immense that the religious communities are saying this whole challenge means we need to shift everything about our assumptions, where we came from, where we're going, why we're here, and what's our responsibility to the greater community of life. Because fundamentally, again, as we've been saying over and over again, this is, it's not only about an extension of ethics that the ethical philosophers have been dealing with very brilliantly and, and very intricately, but it's about taking our place amidst a community of life, inheriting. We are trustees of an immensely complex, rich process. And so we're seeing ourselves um, as part of 14.7 billion years of evolution. Um, and therefore participating in the future of this process. Um, now, we've all told personal stories, and, and I'll, I'm sure I'll run out of time to describe um, what's happening in the religions. But I do want to say, first of all, I've been immensely moved by many of your personal stories. And I just want to say my entry into the why the world's religions, I think, matter and can, can make a contribution it's just that I went to Japan in 73, 74 amidst this, the Vietnam War and civil rights and I participated in a lot of that and had terrible sense of grief and, and the clash that we were all feeling then, deeply feeling. I was part of all those demonstrations in college in Washington, D.C. And after doing a master's in literature, and so I said, I need to go somewhere different and see the world in a different place. I went to Japan and taught there for uh, almost two years. And it absolutely changed my life, changed my sense of worldview, changed my sense of values and ethics, why people operate on very different assumptions. And I was completely blown away. And of course, in seeing the Zen gardens in Kyoto and so on, um, and, and in the early 70s, this was a place that was still at the end of what I would call the Meiji era, the, you know, the, the end of its very, very traditional phase. And there were very, not many foreigners. I was in a city of, of a couple hundred thousand people, but there were about six foreigners, and I'd come around the corner with my height and my blue hair, you know, blue eyes hair, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, oh, you caught it. Um, <laughs> and, and, and people would literally freak because they had not seen a foreigner. And they would tell time by the, the Showa period, which is the imperial reign. This was an amazing you know, step back into a 19th century world, right? Now, I was so fascinated by this, how the, how the world looked from that perspective, that I began to study these traditions and try and understand Buddhism and then Confucianism, because I realized Confucianism was really how people relate, how society, what the glue of the society is, and so on and so forth. And then I began to, as I traveled, and John and I were in Japan again in 81, 82, and, and we began to see, my God, <laughs> Japan's got its environmental laws and, and constraints and so on. But the rest of Asia, as it's beginning to develop, and, and Japan's becoming predators to all the resources there, we are on a collision course as modernity begins to seep into the Asian world, as, as we all know now, especially with China and India, uh, two billion people. So this narrative of progress and industrialization that we have infected the rest of the world with um, was in the, the back of our minds and consciousness. Um, and the development right now in China is, is beyond measure. And, uh, but it extends all the way to the other part of, I call it Eurasia, to Dubai, where the development is not to be believed, including golf courses underwater hotels, ski jumps, 45 four-star hotels in a, in a place that has five inches of rain a year. This narrative of endless progress and consumption is right across, as we know, the Eurasian world, two-thirds of the world's people. So we said, 
we're not scientists, we're not policy people, we're not economists. What can we contribute to a sense that is there, are there possibilities for different forms of modernity? Everybody wants their refrigerator in their car. How can we deny, you know, these aspirations of the human? But what are forms of modernity going to look like that are culturally diverse? Um, and, and what kinds of ethics can emerge in these countries and cultures that are going to be different and distinct uh, from our own? And so we began with um, probably a, hardly a sense of what was ahead of us, and this is 10 years ago now, to convene um, at Harvard at the Center for the Study of World Religions a group of both scholars and environmentalists and scientists with this notion of thinkers and activists, doers um, and sort of philosophers, to say, first, what, what could Buddhism contribute? And, and Susie was there. And what could later Judaism can contribute? And Mitch and David and others were there. And Baird was at a number of these, these conferences um, as well. And But we began with just this very humble notion. And I appreciate that, David, because the whole point of these conferences was to convene, as has been done here, a space for our collective thinking. This wasn't about the ego of academics because we did not have the answers. There was no field of study. And we began to realize, um, as people said, we've got to do this for the rest of the world's religions, um, that we were beginning to create the foundations for a new field of study but that had implications for policy. And we were trying to model collective scholarship, engaged intellectuals reaching out to the world beyond the ivory tower and so on. And so this um, ended up by over a 1,000 participants just in the, the conference series um, at Harvard uh, with tremendous generosity of spirit and with this sense that they had, people had studied these traditions, learned these languages, been in these countries and cultures for hundreds of years in, in terms of the scholarship, but many of them personally had lived in these places and wanted to bring to bear something of this collective sense. We're creating a new multiform planetary civilization, even though that wasn't even in our consciousness then. Um, and I could suggest the energy that was, was created in, for example, just from the indigenous conference, which maybe John will refer to later in his talk, people, this was all before 9-11, it's 96 to 98, and so we were very fortunate to bring people from all over the world, again with very generous uh, funders. The indigenous conference, people from every continent, and the dignity, the struggles, the um, sense of work at great odds for the biodiversity and cultural diversity that they were standing for was astounding. And of course, along with that, the anger and the frustration and the loss and the fear. But what emerged was a sense of common solidarity. This sense I was trying to bring in early, a common ground is the common struggle, but also the earth itself. And each one of these conferences somehow generated in very mysterious and ma almost magical ways this sense that the Islam conference, people from Africa, the Middle East, all the way to Indonesia, the whole um, spectrum of Islam was represented. And very different perspectives from Sunni and Shia. And yet, this sense, a billion people influenced by Islam, we've got to make a difference. We've got to, to bring this tradition into uh, conversation with these pressing modern problems. Now, we realized we had to bring these papers into some kind of form, and we brought together groups of experts and, and so on. And so there is a, a, a series of books of 10 volumes um, from these conference series. Um, the Shinto one's in Japanese, so. Um, uh, but the Shinto gathering was the largest gathering of Shinto people outside of Japan. And trying to think, how do we re-understand this indigenous tradition, which was so distorted in the Second World War? And how do we come back and rethink the foundations of our, of our Japanese uh, nature-based uh, traditions. Now, let me just um, tell another story, because we also made a move um, to say all of this had to be done in relation to what we call dialogue partners. And we called it seep, with this notion we're kind of seeping through 
the, the parameters and perimeters of different disciplines. And so science, education, economics, and policy were the dialogue partners. And in the, these final conferences um, that we had at Harvard and then at the United Nations and at the Natural History Museum in New York, um, we brought people you know, from the World Bank, we brought policy people, we brought George Rupp, the president of Columbia, people from all these different fields. Bill Moyers came to the Natural History Museum. He interviewed people representing these different traditions and so on. Every person came without you know, fees um, or whatever. It was just incredible. But I want to say, and, and this is why this kind of interdisciplinary conversation that you're fostering here just has immense power. When we went into the Natural History Museum to talk to the curator, Mike Novacek, um, to say, you know, we'd like to do something on religion. We know, kind of, oh, science, religion, oh my god, this is the Natural History Museum and stuff. We thought this would be a short conversation. And um, within 10 minutes, Mike said, we know we need this perspective, this spiritual, ethical perspective, and we need it from the various traditions. Because he said, as we have been searching for an ornithology curator position. He said, of the six ornithologists in the, who were finalists for this position, he said four of them had their birds go extinct while they were studying them. And he said, it was such a wake up to the museum and to the staff that they realized they could not just be this so-called objective, distant science research museum. And that's when the, bio, uh, the Hall of Biodiversity went up, um, this incredible Hall of the Universe, the Hall of the Earth, and so on, and that there is an active sense at that museum um, that advocate, we, we need to say what advocacy, but that there's a sense of engaged scientific work is, is part of that. So a thousand people you know, came to this, this conference um, at the Natural History Museum um, with this sense that this new synergy of religion with science and policy um, could make a difference. Now, I should probably wrap this up by, by saying World Watch Institute also, they did a, a volume in, in um, 2002, one of their papers, bringing t together um, examples of what's happening in the world's religion. So policy people are getting this. This was um, also a chapter in World Watch report of, of 2002. Um, and Gary Gardner's coming out with a book um, along these lines. But let me just leave you with kind of a, a spectrum of images of what's happening in this field. Um, and I'm not trying to you know, say everything's perfect or whatever, but it is part of, I think, the creative, reflexive feeling side of the human that's saying these wisdom traditions not only need to be part of the conversation, but may have a fire of moral and intellectual passion for the earth and for future generations that can help synergize and spark the work of, of scientists and policy people um, and so on. And um, I'll, I'll just touch on a few examples from grassroots and, and leadership. Um, and, and before um, I do that, I want to also just say, and there's some brochures here, we created a website to illustrate what the different world's religions are contributing, both from grassroots and from the uh, more academic side. The literature is immense. The literature is just bubbling up. And we've done annotated bibliographies of all the literature of these traditions in English, which has taken us about six or seven years. But these are resources we can now draw on. And we've also done sections on science and policy and economics to bring the ecological economics to bear. And as I mentioned the other day, someone has spent 25 years documenting the integrated sciences, um, the complexity sciences, the evolutionary and bi biological sciences, to say, here's the, the, as this emerging universe is being understood by the science community, we can see how the religions can enter into that conversation. So finally, some grassroots um, examples, there are, tree planting projects um, all over the Asian world. And certainly, uh, there, there are Buddhist monks in Thailand who are doing this um, in, with great efficacy. Wangari Mathai in Africa, the Green Belt Movement, has done you know, millions of trees with women. And the fact that she got the Nobel Peace Prize is suggesting that environmental, that peace is deeply connected 
to ecological security, for sure. And she has been a participant in, in this work and speaks very eloquently of the spiritual dimension um, of her work. Um, river cleanup. The examples, especially in North India, in the Ganges, um, are absolutely fascinating of the efforts of both leaders and, and, and followers um, to reverse the pollution of these rivers. Um, and as I say, I could give examples from elsewhere. Across the US, there are hundreds of grassroots projects working on these kinds of things. And we're doing a film also to document that and say it's called Renewal, and to say this is a movement that, that needs to be linked up and synergized. Um, Leadership-wise, um, I'll just give you two examples, three, I guess, um, and, and conclude. One, um, if we take the Christian world and we talk about liberal or progressive areas, um, and as I suggested, at the conference represented Catholic, all the pro as many Protestant communities as we could get, evangelicals and Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Roman Orthodox perspectives. And the volume represents that as well. Now, it might not be known to, to many, but the most significant leader in the Christian world comes from the Greek Orthodox community. And Bartholomew, based in Istanbul, um, has led seven symposiums on science, religion, and the environment, which have been mind-boggling. We, we've been on three of these, the most recent this summer in the Amazon, um, but they've been mostly concentrated in Europe, the Black Sea, um, the Aegean, the, the Baltic, um, the Danube River, and so on. And he has brought together scientists, journalists, um, administers of the environment, UN leaders, um, NGOs, the most amazing cross spectrum of, of people. Um, and you know, we can talk about that, but it is extraordinarily effective, extraordinarily effective. Um, and, and his uh, writings have now been collected in a volume. He's speaking about ecological sin, crimes against creation. This is very strong language. In the Islamic world, um, twice we were in Tehran in 2001 in the summer, um, and then last year in May. Now, the um, Iranian government convened this conference with UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, the Iranian constitution has a plank which says sustainability based on Islamic principles has got to be something that we support. They have very strong uh, birth control concerns. Uh, they have immense biodiversity and the issues of water. You're flying into Tehran and this is a city of 12 million people. And the first time we were there, they had water for eight hours a day. I mean, the water issues are just you know, staggering in this part of the world. Um, the president of uh, Hatami spoke. He is the one who suggested the dialogue of civilizations to the UN. This is not an axis of evil. This new administration I won't speak for, but, but these are people who are deeply concerned about their Islamic and environmental uh, uh, movement and survival in this part of the world. Indonesia, as well, is beginning to convene their Muslim leaders. Um, I was in Indonesia last summer. I felt I was in the mid middle of Jared Diamond's collapse. Mm. 240 million people. I would finish a talk, and the very first thing would be a, a place of 6,000 islands. Why won't the US sign the Kyoto Protocol? It's an island country. It's just incredible. Uh, I mean, one moderator, because the attacks just had, had to apologize to me at the end. I mean, I was practically in tears. It was so sad. It was, I was in tears, actually, but it was so sad with this, this sense of their outrage um, at, at the US and, and the Western world. The loss of biodiversity, the forests, and so on, we know all of that. Um, China, very hugely complex and um, immensely problematic. But as I suggested, it was one of the reasons we started this was to say, Duwei Ming, one of the great Confucian scholars who's been working with my professor at Columbia for 25 years to reintroduce Confucianism into the Chinese context with immense success because there's a vacuum clearly there. Now, what happened about three years ago 
was the um, EPA Deputy Director Pong Yue um, issued a statement 25 pages long, as we had it translated, single space, to say China needs an ethics based on Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. And they are now translating these volumes into Chinese. They are trying to think this through. And one of the things we hope to do is have conferences in China uh, and in India to help synergize and, and raise this um, profile. Um, I'll end with what we all know, I think, one of the most amazing and surprising uh, things that has happened over this last, really, three years is the evangelical community getting on board for climate change. And that happened in part because the evangelicals in the UK convened a conference at Oxford in 2002. And they brought John Houghton and Jillian Prance, who are scientists, who are evangelicals themselves, and they brought US evangelicals and said, here's the science of climate change. And these leaders, especially Rich Sizek and several others, got it, said it's a moral issue. And for them, it's a moral issue because it will affect the poor around the world um, in all these kinds of ways that we know. And that has created a whole new movement that I think is extremely positive and powerful. Thank you, and thank you for all the work uh, that each one of you is doing. Um, so. It was fabulous, both of these talks. Um, and uh, Kathleen, just a question. I, I'm going to mention this probably tomorrow, too. I think I, it's not, I, I don't think being a good storyteller is easy. I think it's a real skill that people develop. Um, and I wonder if you might reflect a little bit on your own evolution as a storyteller. Because again, I'd like to hear a little about how you built this capacity for yourself. Well, I have kind of a dual track background, and on the one hand, um, you know, I have, I have a philosophy background, and so what I was trying to do as a graduate student was write clearly, and to make things absolutely clear, and, and no matter how abstract they were, to to make them understandable. And on the other hand, you know, I had this incredible love of the outdoors, and I was doing the writing, of course, about that, and I used to think those were two separate things. Mm -hmm. um, and, then it, and then it occurred to me that I could perhaps that, that perhaps one of the things I should think about is what we all should be thinking about, and that's what writers always tell each other, who is your audience and what is your purpose. And uh, when I started to think about that you know, very deeply, what is the purpose of my, my working life? Who is the audience I want to reach? Um, I realized I didn't want to reach professional philosophers. I wanted to reach a broader group than that. Mm -hmm. And my purpose was to, to make some real change in how people would think. So, so I think that what has really helped my creative writing is the clarity that philosophical work brings to it. That's the answer. I just want to follow up. How, how um, you're writing on in several modes now, yes. uh, you know, for philosophers, for the public, and I'm curious about how your the the world of philosophy has reacted to the work you have accomplished for other audiences, if at all? Um, generally, they don't pay me much attention. They think I'm probably pretty harmless. <laughs> some, some people think that I'm doing interesting work in an interesting way. You know what? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, but uh, you, you, the other side of that question is, what do the scientists think of my work as a creative writer? And that gets interesting too, because of course I'm trying to publish in places like conservation biology, um, and, and and I have to really be careful and constrain myself. And every once in a while, something terrible will happen. Like I'll write a sentence like, um, "We were in the forest and we heard the owl, and we didn't know if it was an owl itself or one of the research scientists calling the owls to prayer." Well, you know, and they come back and they said, there, "There's just no place for poetry in a journal like this." And so I go, "Okay, fine. There's no place." Um, so it's it's challenging and fun, and I and I have to think. And creative writers learn to revise. And, and, the, and writing is the only thing in anybody's life that I know of where you can do it again and again and again until you get it right. <laughs> so. I wonder if you know, uh, in working with story, if you feel um, sometimes also the tug of the, of the oral, because story is so uh, ancestral in us, and before we got into the written thing, which is damn recent, um, you know, Mary Evelyn, you spoke of, you know, 200,000 years um, or 2 million years uh, for us uh, 
two-leggeds, but you know, at least since we've had language for a yeah, uh, hundred thousand years, we had to be passing on a lot of knowledge, information, uh, but how are we going to pass it on? Um, it had to be in stories. Um, all the information was held in stories. So this is so deeply layered into us. It's such an archetypal modality of languaging. Um, long, long, long before we ever got into speaking in more representational ways about the world. We were telling stories of the world. And Mary Evelyn and John, you guys also, in your way, you're working with the new story. It's a central part of your, of your work, but also calling the religions into play because they're the ones who, in a sense, hold the big framing story, the sense that everybody uh, seems to carry that or the need for living inside a story uh, that we are characters in. So there's a link here between the working with also very humble and simple stories of our everyday life and the, the awareness that we have to be tapping into this very ancestral modality that somehow our nervous system uh, clues itself into so, so readily. We've got to engage it and turn it toward what's, what's called for. Yeah, I totally agree. Mitch. Um, well, I, I really um, appreciated David's comments referring to Kathleen's, the, the relationship between the, the deeply spiritual, the deep ecological awareness and the quotidian aspects of everyday life. And thinking about that um, leads to a question I have for uh, Mary Evelyn and John. I, I'm, I'm as, as, as you were describing your just really amazing accomplishments and uh, in, in tandem with, with all these wonderful people, I, was, I realized how incredibly biased the North American news media is in reporting on the world's religions and how um, I've, I've sort of been brainwashed uh, in, in many respects by the New York Times um, who, who, who constantly harp on a particular you know, perspective in this regard. Um, and, and I felt daunted in listening to you about how little I really understand about all of this, and how little I'm aware of it. And how, you know, I've read about this, for example, how in so much of Islamic culture is, has created a, a, an anti-Jewish propaganda, um, a, a kind of, uh, uh, to, to use our president's term, almost a, a fascist educational mentality, right? And I, I listened to you and I realized, well, my gosh, that. That, that can't be true, in a sense. And I guess my question is, what is the role of religious education around the world? Because obviously so much of, 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 the, of, of the learning takes place in those domains. And are there movements within Islamic education, let's say, or within non-Western Christian education um, that are clearly beginning to look at the ecological picture in relationship to the religious picture? Because this is so crucial, because these are, you know, the, the, the five-year-olds, the 10-year-olds, the 15-year-olds, and, and how are they growing up? And do, do you have, are there people within this, this vast network that you've created who are really beginning to mobilize education in that regard? That's my question. It took me a while to get to it, but that's what it is. Well, I just give one example from um, Indonesia that really blew me away. And, you know, we're, we're learning this all the time. And, we, you know, this is a sliver or a slice of what's actually happening because it's way beyond, you know, what we even can, can imagine, I think, or have a full picture. But what was amazing to me last summer in Indonesia was um, this a university convened a similar type of multidisciplinary conversation, but with a focus on religion and ecology, but with scientists and NGO people and so on. And at that conference, there was this um, Muslim leader who, it turns out, is a Wangari Mathai. He's been doing tree planting in his area outside of Jakarta, about three hours, with based on Islamic principles. And then it turns out, that this whole NGO group um, in Indonesia is working with what's called the Prasantrams, which are high schools and boarding schools where Islamic teachings for the environment is already being you know, activated. And I was blown away by this. Um, and so we went back to Jakarta and then we went out to see his tree planting thing. This guy deserves a Goldman Prize. 
I mean, he's amazing, and he is funny, and he's engaging, and he sings with the people. You know, he's not like some pretentious uh, American-hating kind of person, and he works with the local um, government and, and so on. But they have put in place, and this is a story that needs to be told, in their educational system, in particular in these persantrants, um, an ecology and Islamic combination, because this is a country on the state of culture. A collapse, and they know it. 240 million people with resources burning literally around them, and immense corruption, and the Fremont mine thing, and all kinds of, of stuff. We, we met with the, the minister, and, and he says to us, um, Well, you know, the, the mining situation, well, we need industry. You know, they are caught between so many contradictions. It's just, it's unbelievable. How prevalent is the program, though, that you're talking about that he's doing? I mean, is it? Oh, it's quite wide. This is what I'm saying. The, the persantrants are, are very widespread. And the other thing is um, Irma Wittler, whose husband is now the present foreign minister of Indonesia, and she's the, they're one of the representatives for the Millennium Development Goals, is convening Islamic leaders in Jakarta precisely for this purpose of environmental education. But the, the Muslim ulama in national organization has already issued several years ago a, a fatwa, and fatwas can be positive too, a, a fatwa on birth control. And they want to do the same thing for a nationwide fatwa on environmental issues. So there's, a, there's an immense potential here. I have a question. Um, Early on in the project that I did on, on communication of climate change and social change, I got really interested in the question of how to communicate urgency. And I did a literature search and you know about communicating urgency. And the one, the one reference that I found for it was actually um, an instructional article for writers. And the title of that article was "Every Good Story Needs Urgency." And I thought, can we flip this? Does every urgency need a good story? <laughs> and so the question to you is, what are the stories we need to tell right now to convey urgency in a way that doesn't just scare, that doesn't just you know get people to stick their heads in the ground, that engages? What are the stories we need to tell? Maybe that's open to all. But <laughs> well, to me, we heard three this morning that touched me very deeply. Tony talking about his experience on Independence Pass and his, the, the, the dying gasps of his father. And Kathleen also telling a story about her father with a misplaced piece of salmon, a misplaced alarm clock. And immediately it brought to me my own father, who's 90, 20 miles down the road. And I am also fumbling, misplacing alarm clocks and bringing salmon he doesn't want. Mm -hmm. and, and then we hear about the sixth planetary extinction. And it made me uh, think of how we, as a people, are misplacing we're fumbling about. We don't know how to do this. We don't know. And yet we all care. And that to me is why we're here. Mm -hmm. Listening to Mary Evelyn made me, and, and all of us, uh, all of you too, it made me realize that this story that hasn't been told because it hasn't been invented or even imagined is the story of the worldview of Americans after we get through the Pinch point, presuming that we can. In other words, if we can assume that it, that that if Mary Ellen is right in what she's saying, which is such a fantastic idea, that that this moving through time is also moving into a different kind of spirit, a different kind of relating to one another and to the earth, then the story that needs to be written is what does my great granddaughter believe about who she is in the world and how she relates and what her obligations are. You know that new world view. I, I, I don't know. He's writing it again. Yeah, it's always coming home. Margaret Atwood's works in great doesn't look like that. Dave? You know, uh, we tell each other stories, and I, I think there's a lot of eloquent storytelling here. Uh, some around the circle, some in, in written form. 
but we also tell each other stories as people, as nations. And Mary Ellen, the the reason we haven't signed on to the Kyoto Accord, I think, is traceable back to a story we tell each other about how good we are as a people. And we hear this every four years, or maybe it's every two years, about how the American people are so wonderful and kind and generous. And therefore, that justifies and excuses everything else. And it's as if all these wonderfully eloquent stories can't be heard because the one big megaphone goes out and tells us that we are such a fine, wonderful, God-chosen people that will excuse whatever else that we do. And the American way of life is sacrosanct. Those are stories that we tell each other up here at the national level, and it seems to drown out all the other stories. I really like the idea that the movie you're doing, David Kennard, how do you see, how do you and John see that larger story? Because you're raising the ante, you're, you're placing us in this journey of literally millions of years. And how does that story play against these national myth level stories that we tell each other that excuse the most egregious national sins? How do you see that playing out? I think it's such a great question. It comes back to Susie's um, because my grandfather was a historian of, of Europe. Uh, and his last book, he was actually one of the founders of nationalism, the field of nationalism. And his last book was Nationalism and Religion. And I think what we're playing up against is all kinds of nationalisms to create new international consciousness. But not only international, we need this declaration of interdependence, you know, mm -hmm. such as the Earth Charter. And so in these two films, what I mean, the, the one that's illustrating grassroots environmental projects is trying to say it's on the ground. It's all of these rest of, you know, projects that have been mentioned here. So it's grassroots. But the, the sense of universe story I think is something that can break the hold. I'm not you know, saying it's going to do this, but I think it has the possibility of breaking the immense hold on us that we are Americans solely. That, in other words, what does planetary citizenship imply? Let me, can I interrupt just ask one question here about that? If you were a speechwriter for a candidate accepting the nomination of, you know, I don't know, Republican Party's nomination for presidency in 08, how would you put that story? What are the words you use? This one you're on the spot, I know, but how would you approach those words at that time to change, to alchemize this national mythology to something much grander? I think that is one of the most important questions. If I could sidestep it for a minute. <laughs> 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 just say. Where's my trapdoor? No, it's such a great question. And but I wanted to just illustrate the possibility that I do hold up in, in some of my talks to say the European community, out of two world wars and out of the immense clash of nationalism, which was the obsession of historians to try and understand this, the causes of and so on, and to say out of this highly nationalistic consciousness has come a European Union with economic unity and political unity with all kinds of problems without the Constitution yet ratified, but it's an achievement that wouldn't have been imagined 50 years ago. And Jean Monnet and others who imagined this dreamed it into possibility. And then, you know, all the other bureaucracies. And I think that's a model that we need to take forward to suggest that our survival as nations, nation states, depends on this profound, new, and energizing connection to the life support systems of the planet as well as to future generations. And I deeply believe, this is my political speech, I deeply believe if we make this appeal for children and grandchildren, as you've eloquently done, and so on, that we can say, and it's been said here elsewhere, what is and it's not just the, the measurement. What's the air and soil and water on which future generations can depend? And if we take air and soil and water and we realize we have the law of the seas for, for water, we have, we're beginning to think about air with the Kyoto Protocol and so on, and with soil and biodiversity and so on, the Convention on Biodiversity, we are beginning to think about three of the key components 
of, of this whole ecological integrity into the future. And I think that's extremely po possible and, and, and hopeful. And why couldn't a candidate, I mean, accepting or be, at an inauguration in 2008, as near as that, be able to say, to speak of America and to say, but we are all not just Americans. We are also citizens of this vast spherical reality and have to be uh, uh, respectful and learn to live as neighbors of all the other citizens here in one fell swoop at an inauguration that would deeply heal or begin to heal this tremendous animosity and disgust with righteous disgust with this country. So it seems to me it would be, you know, devoutly to be wished and it would be a very practical thing to say. It's an absence that we hope will become a presence. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what Kennedy did. He called a generation into a Peace Corps. He called a generation yeah. into, into a caring. And I think people profoundly want to make caring contributions to the future. Yes. They profoundly do. That's the, that's the, uh, the juice. Mm. David, can I turn that question back on me? I'd be really interested in some thoughts you have on how you might set up. Let's say something of revising this myth. Uh, I'll tell you what, I get my turn tomorrow at 9. Okay. Okay. Can I just hold it for them? Because that's, yeah. <laughs> that buys me some time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that, that, you know, if, if we could go around here, the words being spoken around the circle are so powerful. And really the mission, as I read the mission, and I came in late, so I'm not quite sure what the mission of the state of being, but couldn't you imagine this group or selected people in this group being a speechwriter for someone accepting the nomination of both parties? Yeah. To redefine <laughs> yeah. the words by which we define ourselves. And they, it would be the cornerstone, would be, you, know, you, you pick the theme, but it could be, I mean, I'd be willing to accept a page out of the right wing book, this devotion to life. And if, if you follow devotion to life and just say, okay, uh, you've made life uh, an absolute principle, we can live with it. And if you want to say that life begins at conception, well, we're fine, we'll, we can live with that too. But if the principle is life and we accept that, then follow where that principle will take you. And the principle takes you to being life doesn't end at birth. You've got to take care of every child. You know, child should go to bed hungry at night or be ill-fed or lack medical coverage and care and love and nurture. There ought to be no such thing as an illegal sale of assault weapons or death penalty or wars in Iraq. And you've got to be for the Endangered Species Act. And if you can't be for those things, you don't have a principle, you have an ideology. Principle doesn't allow you to make exceptions. But you could see it joining. I think of the concerns of right and left. A language of uh, that accommodates life, and as you so eloquently said, time, caring, feeling, all the words have been spoken around here. Why can't they be put back into the political language? Because politics is where we say we. The markets are where we say I. And it seems to me that we're, we're here because market language, the word of I, mine, my, has predominated over the language that draws us together as we in this larger community of life. That, that it seems to me, is a mission. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll say this Carol in PowerPoint Smith. tomorrow morning at 9. <laughs> 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 um, I, I would a just like language. to follow up on that. And why couldn't we as a group take this as an exercise? In other words, as we were to sort of think about this kind of narrative and, and go through some examples tomorrow sometime, if we could come up with some narratives that would it would satisfy this question that David raised, this important question. Okay. Carolyn, can, can I say one thing before the line to follow that? This is the third group of which I've been a part in the last uh, roughly 90 days of people who are famous, well-known, accomplished people, but representing different branches, trying to say or do the same thing. And I could imagine a larger gathering of people like us, these other two groups, and maybe others, I'm sure they're me, 
to begin to develop the common language. And it isn't for Democrats, Republicans, because in many ways, uh, the issues aren't right or left, uh, liberal or conservative, they're how we in the present orient to the future. That's the real dividing line at the time. And I think the psychology people here have a special gift to offer this community and by helping us craft language that taps into people's uh, subconscious. I mean, not devious, but awaken. Uh -huh. You know, awaken. There's lots of people That's who have that, including the writers. Right, and exactly. Yeah. And one thing I get from all this is just that without naming grief right up front in any rap, it ain't going to sink in very deep because everybody's feeling it consciously or unconsciously.